What's up, everyone? This is Dr. Tan on season nine of Alone, and I'm here with Juan Pablo, Terry, and Tom. And we are discussing some things directly from the fans, from our Facebook group, from our Instagram, from our YouTube. And these are questions that uh, you will not find anywhere else. So we hope this is entertaining. And for those of you who are following us right now, uh, who had no idea what Alone is, uh, let's show you. And there goes our last connection to the outside world. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Squirrel. I got game. Oh, no. There's a point for everybody at which you break. Alone, Thursday at 9, only on the History Channel. Next day on the History Channel app. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, I want to know what you guys have been up to because I literally haven't seen your faces in months. Uh, Juan Pablo, what's going on with you? Yeah, so lately I've been just working and working at the computer, just finishing um, a book that I've been writing for over a year. Um, yeah, a little bit of canoeing here and there, some camping trips, and yeah, not much other than nice. that. Nice. Do we get a... <laughs> Watching us. Amazing. Um, do we get a sneak peek of what the topic of the book is? Because... Uh... Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I had a little bit of a sneak peek in the book and I'm so excited because I just read a small portion and it is pure literary gold. Um, well, thanks for putting it that way. <laughs> I would never put it that way, but um, yeah, so it's about long-term uh, wilderness survival and yeah, it's basically like all the things I've, I've learned through my own experiences and then just like lots of research and just putting it together in a way that I would like to read it, yeah. Right on, right on. And Terry, you just came down from the mountains. What's uh, going on with you? First, I'd say it's so wonderful to see all, all of your faces. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, really disconnected from the electronics side of things. That's typically how I navigate this life. Uh, been in the Kenai Mountains and the Talkeetna Mountains, uh, hiking every day, uh, fishing every day, and uh, smiling every day. I, uh, I also uh, been working on a book, nowhere near the literary gold of some amongst us, but uh, just, a, just a goofy little set of uh, stories about mistakes I've made, basically. And, uh, so yeah, really excited about that. And like JP said, watching everybody and really enjoying seeing everybody out there. So just spending out time, time outside and smiling mostly. Right on. Yeah, I'm excited to read that too. I know if no one knows about your stories, they are missing out. This guy has a life full of adventures and misadventures and <laughs> oh shit moments that uh, I think anyone would appreciate. Yeah, Terry, I definitely want to better read that book if you want <laughs> i uh oh i'll be leaning on all of you hard when it uh starts to come into fruition uh though i'm afraid nobody may want to talk to me after you read it but uh <laughs> no. nah, it's, uh, it shows the character it shows the character and tom uh what have you been up to man Oof, man it's been it's been an absolute whirlwind since i got back i mean i uh, i um I, I was 12 hours back in Virginia before I, before I was in the woods, whitetail hunting and managed to put one down. So, um, uh, you know, that was awesome. That, that got me right back into my flow and uh, managed to put a few deer in the freezer. And then I've been really fortunate to have, I've had Adam Riley and Terry Burns both at my cabin in the right on. weeks. Super stoked about that. I feel like I'm, I'm getting uh, something that we're all really hungry for. We haven't seen each other in a while and, I've been blessed to have all these wonderful people like sitting on my porch. Uh, Terry was a little too brief, but I hope we're going to do it again here soon. And uh, so, yeah, turkey season came along and I had I had guests by for that. And between that and running the cattle and cutting hay and, and, and doing the prescribed fire program, it's like, uh, you know, it's funny from from where I'm sitting now, it's almost like it didn't even happen until the show aired and seeing everybody out there and what everyone's doing and just, all the B-roll shots of the landscape and all the stuff is, is, is flooding memories back because up until this point, I mean, it honestly just felt like a bizarre dream I had, like it wasn't real. We've got nothing from there to show anybody except for the stories that they don't understand. So 
the second the show aired, you know, all this stuff started flooding in. So I'm processing all that, but I'm just loving it, man. And it's so great to be seeing everybody here now. So that's, that's about it for me. Yeah. I I a hundred percent agree with that sentiment. Like it's a, it makes me remember and miss that home. And it's so cool to see everyone's little slot of land because uh, some of the like B roll and um, heli uh, images, I'm like, but that's like someone's land, but like my property's like right there. Yep. It's, yeah, it's, dude. it's so cool. Episode one, I wasn't even in. And that night I dreamed Labrador so hard. Like it was crazy. Like it was just all this stuff. Just, you know, it, it, my brain was just latching onto it. So yeah, I can't wait to see more of it. It's been really awesome. Right on. All right. Let's move on to our first question. I'll uh, say it out loud for everyone. What started your interest in survival, uh, Terry? <laughs> What's your backstory? Oh, what started my interest in survival? First, I would start by saying I'm not a true survivalist, not a bushcrafter, no training of any kind whatsoever. Uh, fascinated in those things, but never really took the time to cultivate them. Um, necessity would be what I would say started my interest. I grew up hunting and fishing, and I found that I found solace in the outdoors. And also, it felt good to try to contribute, you know, to the family and to the food supply. And it started there. I, uh, yeah, I basically from the time I could walk, I was fishing. And I don't know how much you want me to rattle on. Um, no, I, I'm just trying to imagine like a little Terry and I can't. <laughs> like, <laughs> full beard, 6'2", <laughs> straight from birth. Like, yeah, that, that's Terry. <laughs> well, I had the same haircut back then. <laughs> that hasn't changed. Um, oh, so we're going to go into like, that's good for start. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And uh, JP, how about you? You've had so many uh, long expeditions and adventures. Uh, what's kicked off this whole whole uh, journey for you? I just remember just being a really like really young and like watching these um, survival stories on TV and just being like, wow, like the adventures and they were so powerful to me those stories. So I was just like hooked from like a very early age into adventure and survival. So. Absolutely. I feel like for me, it was almost like a two-faced thing. You know, like uh, I'm sure everyone here knows what it feels like to have that adrenaline, you know, that good stuff, uh, whether that's from a hunt or doing something incredibly stupid. Uh, for me, I grew up uh, traveling. So my both my parents were in international business. So I'd go to different places. And then at a young age, I wanted to travel more. So I did that and just did the stupidest things, falling into ravines, no contact, lost in the Amazon on ayahuasca, you know, like just the stupid <laughs> things. And then I think you come to a point where you're like, okay, this is like fun, but incredibly dangerous. No one knows where I am. I don't know how to fix myself. I have no kind of preparation for this and uh, everything around me wants to kill me. So like you, you need to get trained up or smartened up. Um, and at the same time, I just found indigenous communities around the world, just so welcoming and so knowledgeable that um it became a fascination a fascination and appreciation you know every time i was there they were giving me so much they're giving me housing food and and uh education and uh, i felt like i was just taking you know so um at a young age i decided to work with uh, nonprofit stuff uh to kind of give back to the community while i was learning from it and uh yeah i think uh survival stuff is basically living for them and that just birthed that you know in addition with all that military stuff, which uh, was, again, more adrenaline re related. How about you, Tom? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's a little bit of everything on the plate there. Um, much like Terry, I, I started out doing this stuff at a young age. And, and I also wouldn't consider myself a, a student of the of the skills. Um, and, and similar to to you, um, I grew up traveling, you know, with my father and my and my mother who were, you know, conservation biologists that traveled the world. And um, a lot of the time, um, the, I, if you really want to go back to the formative years, it was honestly just being a kid playing with other kids. It just so happened that the other kids that I was playing with had some some skills, you know, like uh, 
you know, you're, you're, you're there and you're the only kids and you're in a really remote area and, you know, everybody's leaving and you're like, what are you guys doing today? And they're like, we're going to go check snares. We're going to go set fish traps. Like, uh, can I, I want to come, can I do that? Like, you know, and whether it was that or, or playing soccer, you know, um, with those kids, it just, I, I feel like I came by it a little bit more honestly. Now, you know, that being said, I was also really inspired in the same way that Juan Pablo was to, to dive deeper into that by a lot of the content that was out there. So as a young adult with that type of background, if, if that was what sparked my interest, um, when I saw other people putting out content and the cool things they were doing, I definitely set the hook deep. And so uh, since then, I, I've, I've been pulling out drag. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, it's it's a moving target and it's a life's work and um, it'll never be done. But like, you know, this experience, if anything, it you know, I almost almost wish I could I could do it again now. I'm sure we all do, because, you know, the spark this lit under me for for learning more and realizing what I, what I didn't know. Um, and, and, the, and the strange and different things that I did know from meeting all of you guys that has been really awesome. So, yeah, formatively, I think it was just travel and spending time with indigenous peoples. And then later on, you know, um, and, and, and this is really huge for me, being an immigrant to the U.S., when I first got here, I, I really felt like I was living in a place that was completely devoid of, of culture and not connected with its roots and I, I couldn't have been more wrong when I found the Appalachian community and, and saw the way that they source food and saw the traditions that they have in the woods and how connected to the land they are. Um, yeah, that, that really, that was like blood in the water for me. So I, I'm still chasing that, that dragon and, and I hope to be for the rest of my life. Well, as long as my legs hold out. <laughs> well, by then we might have bionic legs. So I think we're good. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's, uh, man, I'm so excited for what the next few years has in stores for us. I know Benji was talking about like a hunt in January, February. So I hope you guys have like a week or two off and let's even hunt mountain lions. So I'd be down for like, uh, just, I don't know, hang out with, with all, all 10 of us and, uh, yeah, oh, catch ben, up and hunt. anywhere. Benji, can anywhere. Benji, can yeah. We go off this cliff and i'd be like if you say so but i'm coming <laughs> so. right in one of his goats <laughs> <laughs> yeah awesome um we have another question over here was there something in life that prepared you specifically for a loan can you recall uh an event or a series of events i, I see tom shaking his head you want to leave this one off yeah honestly uh uh you know for, for me um, this is going to be like a, a, a little bit of a, of an out of the box answer, but, um, I've, I've been fortunate to live a really rich life. A lot of which was, was not associated with survival or the woods at all, but has always been associated with people and characters. And I've always been drawn to people with incredible stories who've, who've made it through really hard things. I mean, we all know that like, survival in the woods is the least of your worries in the world today as far as the, the struggles and the things that people go through and i would say that being a people person and and meeting people and and seeing them go through so much hell um and come out of it just stronger and and more beautiful that was that was a major inspiration that's that's honestly where the rubber meets the road, that's a more of a survival skill for me because it's, it's up here and all the rest of it can be stripped from you in an instant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, those people were inspirations and, and, uh, and, and, and I feel like, um, you know, it, not enough time to name the names and everything, but just the, the folks I've encountered and their stories and their struggles, um, you know, really pushed me. Right on. No. I'm sure we all share that sentiment. Lots of influential people and communities uh, that have touched our lives. Terry, I saw you nodding your head previously. Do you got you got something? Not now. There's no way. I can <laughs> no one can follow that, that Tom. Oh my word! I can't follow that. Pick him last next time. That is a fantastic <laughs> answer. I. Uh, oh my word! How do I follow that? I went a totally different direction when I heard that. I. Uh, and I'm embarrassed now for where my mind went. 
but I, uh, you know, my mind went to my Appalachian roots, you know, growing up somewhat subsistence, you know, we, uh, we caught a lot of our food and then, you know, fortunate enough to travel, you know, I love to backpack and travel. And as you would say, I'm, you know, have some of those, oh goodness moments and, uh, made plenty of missteps and learned from those. I was in a plane crash in Brazil and ended up living with a indigenous tribe there. Honestly, don't know how long I was there, kind of lost track of time, but learned a tremendous amount from them. And that fueled my love for, you know, learning from people that live that lifestyle, spent time in various locations in Africa, unbelievable trackers there, incredible to pick up from them and then you know moved to alaska and each year spend usually two or three months solo hunting fishing haven't bought meat in 10 years or so with a few wow. caveats to that but uh yeah that's how i get most of my sustenance is hunting and fishing so spending time in the back country i think certainly help you know alone spending time solo in the back country certainly gave me some experiences that I like to draw on and then having a strong support system, you know, incredible friends and family, you know, as Tom spoke of individuals that you meet and inspire you. I think, I think we need to backtrack a little bit because Terry said he was in a plane crash guys. Like what, what would you tell us a little bit about that? I think we have time for a little story time with Terry. <laughs> Talk story with Terry. I love it. Now I feel like I'm interrupting everything. I apologize. For no, no, go for it, man. I, um, yeah, so I went down there in 2011 and went fishing. I try to fish 300 days a year. So, you know, I like to go to new places and chase new, you know, new species. They teach me a lot. So I went down there, enjoyed it, loved it, had the experience of a lifetime. In 2014, I went back. I was backpacking. Uh, I backpacked through Mexico, through Central America and said, hey, I'm this close. Let's go back to Brazil. Flew, uh, took a long series of flights uh, into the Amazonian rainforest, and it wasn't from elevation. It sounds a lot more dramatic than it was, uh, but went to land on the river. We were at flying speed, airspeed, struck a rock. The starboard float ripped off and went by my head, and then it's more like gymnastics, so a lot of flips and spins and things of this nature. Of course, that stopped us instantly. We nosedived, out came the uh, windshield, and it was just the pilot, the co-pilot, and myself, so I ended up having to cut myself out of the uh, five-point harness because the inertia bent the buckles, which I felt bad about. I vividly remember being conflicted about cutting their strap. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And then I looked up at the eight-foot <laughs> dash in the side of the plane. It's like, you know what? This isn't going to be the biggest repair, so I yeah. went and cut the strap. You're mad at the guy. He crashed the he crashed the damn. <laughs> You're like, I'm sorry, I'm cutting your buckles. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and everyone, that good. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> this is a classic Terry moment, guys. This is what he's like all the time. I'm sorry about that. It's funny what goes through your mind, you know, in in moments yeah. of intensity. Yeah. I think danger should bring clarity, and that's what it clarified for me. <laughs> uh, JP, was there something in life that you, uh, pre uh, prepared you for this particular experience? And I think uh, the answer is a resounding yes. Everyone kind of knows, but uh, we want to hear your story. Uh, yeah, well, like, just like, um, I have the adventure bug, and like, I want to do adventures, so... Yeah, I guess like I've, I've done different adventures throughout my life and that helps be, build resilience and experience and and also like as, as Tom and Terry said, like um, first of all, support from my family, you know, and yeah, just having like that, just yeah, people that can support me so that I can I'm able to go, like, I have the privilege of going on these adventures. Mm -hmm. um, I know that. And 
yeah like he tom's answer like so i grew up in mexico right and and when you when you grow up in mexico you're exposed to to people that go through so many challenges mm -hmm. uh like it's in your face every day so um yeah you you really learn to put things into perspective and that that helps you a lot to your mindset so i think that that's a that's a huge aspect mm -hmm. yeah and in terms of like uh survival like I, i've done um i spent six months in in the bush with my partner and we we had like what we call semi-starvation rations so basically enough for you for us not to die but enough for us to be like quite starving uh yeah and we just like went into the bush with our canoe and a few buckets and i managed to convince her to come along which was like it's crazy like no one does that but yeah we had these amazing adventures and obviously that taught me a lot about uh, being out there and I had the opportunity to hunt, fish, trap, all these things. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think the component of seeing immense human suffering, witnessing that and being able to touch that and help that or just to, to witness that, it does put a very strong perspective on things, you know, and uh, seeing people thrive or get out of that situation is incredibly inspirational. I know that's where I draw a lot of my um, context from when I know things are going bad at least we can say it's it's not that bad you know and uh, there have been people who figured things out with uh, not a whole lot and um, knowing that whatever you do out there whatever you bring out there if you lose it or if your plan goes awry then you're going to need to adapt and adapt and adapt and um, getting drilled to do that in the army where they purposely fuck up your plans and <laughs> make you want to uh do something different where the plan immediately goes out of the window uh that was definitely helpful um and to have support like you do juan pablo i hope you're marrying her <laughs> yeah I, I, I don't think there's anyone uh that would go on uh, starvation rations with me like that that's, <laughs> that is insane that is insane like she should apply for season 10 like she, she already has like six, what six months under her belt of starving like sure she could do it again no issues <laughs> <Didn't>. <laughs> yeah next next question i'm really excited about talking about are gear choices um so this doesn't have to be related to your uh 10 items uh it might just be gear that you had on you uh outside your 10 items how did you um strategize of what you brought and um did you repurpose them at all um so whoever wants to go first um yeah On Pablo. <laughs> okay. Um, it took me a long time to choose my items, but um, but once I chose them, I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm not gonna second like I'm not gonna second guess what I'm while I'm out there. I just put my list of like these are the ten items I'm bringing. This is what I'm packing, and that's gonna be it. You know, because I I feel like you would almost always second guess your items. So it's like, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I really modified my stuff. Like I brought these like custom axe, uh, custom sleeping bag. <laughs> um, what else? Yeah, like my gators, I sold them myself. Like uh, as it was shown on the, on TV, yeah, like, um, I had in mind, I already knew, like, I, if there's something to make a chimney, I'm going to use them for the chimney and stuff like that. So it's like <laughs> a miracle that it happened like that. Yeah. It's like perfect. Of course it happened to you, man. You got like fireproof <laughs> yes. fucking gators. When I that, I was so, I was so happy for you and also like, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Like, because I didn't find a piece of trash. I mean, me, I can say that, but I didn't find a, a lick of trash. Yeah. No, that was that was such a fun build to see. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about these uh, customized or like uh, different uh, sleeping bags? And uh, you said your axe was uh, a custom one too. Yeah. So the sleeping bag is actually super interesting to me. Um, like, well, I guess I'm a gear junkie, um, but it's it's like an innovation, you know. Like, um, there's there's some guys that did the Pacific Crest Trail, which is a trail that I've done. Um, and they did it in winter. They were the first people to do it in winter. And, and the system that they used was like a, a down sleeping bag inside a synthetic. Because mm -hmm. when you use your sleeping bag for so long, um, like the insulation will compress and with condensation, all these things. And then most synthetic sleeping bags, they're not thick enough. So what I wanted was best of both worlds. So what I did is just have like a, basically a synthetic uh, outer bag integrated into a, a down inner. So it was like super warm. And at the same time, um, like it seriously could rain inside my sleep, my like on top of the sleeping bag. And even if it was wet, like with me being there for a few days, it would dry out from like the inside. So I wish they made th these kind of bags um, like mass market, but mm -hmm. yeah, I really think interesting it's really innovation. And and it's not my idea. There's there's other sleeping bags that use that um, methodology, but it's it's more for expeditions for Arctic expeditions. So you sewed two bags together? No. Uh, I got, uh, there's there's a company in Calgary that, that makes a sleeping bag. So I got okay. it custom made. Awesome. We're, we're going to have to get that link uh, from you at some point because I'm really <laughs> interested in it. I know on your website, um, you mentioned uh, Featherwood Friends. I know they make a minus 60 down bag, which everyone that I've talked to is uh, the bag that they take up to like um, research stations on the South Pole and that type of thing. Um, but if you're saying that there's one that combines synthetic and uh, feathers, oof. Like I, I, I want to know what that is. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you. There's another brand. It's in my book, I think. But yeah, I'll, I'll give you. Awesome. <laughs> How about you, Terry? Was there something that you repurposed? I, again, I keep following these amazing individuals, and I feel like I have no right to speak whatsoever. I, uh, I really appreciate gear, but I, I don't have very many material belongings. I try to do as much as I can with as little as I can, you know, like the month long solo trips, like I might hike a couple hundred miles. So I want to carry the least amount I possibly can. Uh, mm -hmm. So gear is not my strong suit. Uh, mm -hmm. I chose the 10 items that I chose and the clothing because it's what I was familiar with. Most of it I already had. Most of it I had used uh, extensively and I was familiar with it. Most of it's very simple, easy to maintenance, and that all makes sense to me. Um, repurposing, not a tremendous amount. Um, you know, a few things that I did, like I'd use the trapping wire for flies and for waiting, you know, for waiting the line, waiting the fly to get it into different strike zones and different depths. Uh, used it for the shelter build a little bit. And same with the paracord using it uh using it for fishing and for shelter but other than that not not as nearly as exciting as everybody else unfortunately <laughs> awesome terry and uh how about you tom well i mean you know some of it i'm i'm i can't talk about uh yet based on what's been aired but um obviously everybody's seen my my uh hair modification which paid off for me and uh, I'm really proud of that because on season nine, it's not real easy to get in alone first. Um, and uh, I kind of had that idea driving down the road and uh, I about pulled the hair out. I left thinking about what to do. And I'm, I'm glad I came, came up with that and it did work out for me. But um, besides that, there, there were a couple of other modifications. I mean, I can say one thing I, I can't stress it the importance of research enough because had I done my research better, I never would have, I never would have brought paracord. 
I used it, but I could have gotten by. I've never been in such a rich cordage environment. I mean, that, and I mean, I know how to make primitive cordage, but it's so time consuming. And um, I'd never been in an environment where there were spruce roots and like, holy cow, those things are amazing. I wish I'd had them around when I was a kid building forts and stuff. I mean, I could have gotten by without that 550 paracord, no problem. I still use it because I brought it and, you know, in a lot of ways it's better. I will say that uh, one of the modifications I made to my 550 cord is I remember, I believe it was Britt um, Earhart, Earhart saying that uh, his spring snares froze in Mongolia. Mm. I was worried about that. And so there was a section of my paracord that I had paraffin waxed the sheathing of. Uh, and I hoped that that would <laughs> not to freeze, um, which I believe that it did, um, you know. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, I really feel like um, I took a pretty basic kit uh, based on the, the people that came before me and, and everything that was outside of the box was between my ears. Awesome. No, that's, uh, I, I love those little sneaky things that we didn't really put all to air for everyone else to see. That's, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's that's legit. Yeah, um, actually, Clay uh, posted a video about sharpening an axe uh, with, um, like, mud on, like, wood, which is awesome because uh, he got it razor sharp uh, for his uh, for his field axe, which was really cool to see. Um, for me, I had my multi-tool uh, modified. So I had... Um, a, a spoon gouge to help with like making spoons and like um um and basically whatever i wanted for a digging device uh for wood and then i also had uh, a little chisel which was really good for making different types of um, snares so i basically told uh, my blacksmith friend um, to take all my flatheads and make a different tool with it so he got a chisel that was really easy to strike um a line in my traps um, I can't say too much about what kind of trap I did, but I used it specifically for traps later on. Um, and then another tool, uh, which was really cool and uh, kind of on brand for survival doctors. I turned um, one of my small uh, flat uh, head screwdrivers into a number 11 surgical blade, which is kind of like uh, what you would use to puncture abscesses. And it was so razor sharp that um, that, I'm not sure if any of you got like nail issues over there where your skin kind of split a little bit. Um, but uh, sometimes like that happens in cold weather and whatnot. And uh, to kind of prevent that, um, you've got to kind of pare it down closer to the skin. Um, and then doing like minor other medical stuff, like I was using that uh, quite a bit and it, it maintained its uh, razor sharp edge throughout the season. So super, super happy that I had that. Um, Just a few minor surgeries you were doing there. Yeah. No yeah. spoilers. No spoilers. It, it, actually, <laughs> it actually occurred to me, uh, Temujin. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't think about it before you said it. But um, I. I still. I'm still carrying this thing on my hip. I did make two modifications to my multi tool, as you did. I, I got rid of the flathead screwdrivers because who needs those in the woods? Um, and I just used an angle grinder to do it. But I turned this this large flathead into a fleshing blade. Um, I don't know mm. if you can see yeah. that. Yeah, pretty, I see pretty, that. Pretty crude, but it was very functional. And then this is probably something that I didn't think about. Uh, well, I mean, I, I made it for this purpose, but this is this is a FID. It's a leather working tool. And essentially, mm -hmm. it's a point that is completely buffed. So it's not sharp at all. It's completely rounded. Um, and that was really important to me because I took an extra long belt made out of veg tan carving leather and I used it as my journal and I did artwork on it. And uh, as a leather work, oh, wow. uh, I carved an entire belt. I have a belt here now. I did the, the line work with this fid. The, the fid's important because it doesn't scratch the leather. It just dents it. So I, I did all the drawing on it and uh, have yet to carve and bevel it. But when I'm done, I will have a a belt that has my entire Labrador journey on it. And I look forward to sharing that with folks, but, but I couldn't underestimate the importance of that tool because it's how I marked my time and my accomplishments. And, and I think that's pretty, pretty huge in a survival setting. Absolutely. Like um, for those of you who don't know, like um, we, we have to film as much as possible, you know? Uh, so journal diaries, like I can imagine how, 
uh, people would want to write down stories and stories and stories instead of uh, writing it on camera or uh, recording it on camera. So that's super cool. And I'm excited to see what the end product uh, looks like. Uh, for me, I was like trying to recite things over and over my head to make sure I wouldn't forget what I wanted to talk about or wanted to do. And um, uh, when I got back, it was like uh, I had to write everything on paper. Like, I, I don't think I stopped writing for 23 hours straight. I just kept on writing and writing and writing. Um, so that's a really cool tool. Do you heat that at all for the, the leather etching or just like no, you, pressure? You wet the leather. When you wet okay. the it, you you can emboss it very easily. So uh, I would I would every morning I'd wake up and lick my thumb and I I, I didn't know how long I was going to be there. So I've got a finite amount of space. So I was really conservative. With it. <laughs> I would just lick my thumb and rub a little spot and make some little picture about my day and then be like, Shh, I might need this, you know, like, who knows, you know, day 150. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need suspenders, you know, there before too long. Right on. That's so funny. I think one other thing that I really loved having out there, like you can bring a shemog out there. Mine was uh, made out of wool. So I had a wool shemog out there and um, a lot of people had pretty um, uh, like negative rated sleeping bags, I think range from like minus uh, 40 to below for most people. So um, it could get a little sweaty over there. So to have that as like open bag and then like a wool shemog on you, like was the perfect temperature for me and just wiping down the sweat uh, overnight, kept everything really dry inside the sleeping bag. Next question we have about um, hygiene, things about stank, teeth, nails, and unfortunately none of us can touch base on the menstrual cycle. Did you guys do anything specifically for hygiene or like smells and stuff like that? I, I, I kind of feel like, you know, um, when you let your body balance out that, that, um, that hygiene actually becomes less of an issue. I know that sounds funny, but like when you're bathing all the time, when you're using a lot of soap, using a lot of shampoo and you're in that routine, you know, when you don't use those products, you really stink. But like when you're, when you, when you go into the environment we were in and you're not using those products, the, the the natural biome of your skin and the oils in your hair and stuff like that i feel like they start to balance out uh from a ph side i i don't have the background to defend that theory but i know that after some time um i actually felt a little bit cleaner i was really careful about my hands i don't think i'm giving away anything by saying that i made multiple different wooden tools to eat my food with i was very conscious about not putting my fingers in my mouth when I was eating my food. Um, I, as miserable as it was when I killed game, if it was cold, I went to the Creek. I started with uh, spruce branches, rubbing my hands with the water, using that as an abrasive and then moved from that to sand and really tried to focus on getting underneath my nails. That blunt fit tool on my Leatherman helped for that too, keep my nails clean. Um, and uh, and then using uh, heat from the fire as well. Before I would eat my food, while my food was cooking, I would put my hands over the fire and uh, and and try to try to you know sort of burn off whatever might be left over. But I, I was I, con cross contamination was a concern for me, and so it was something that I tried to work into my routine and be really religious about. No, oh, that's all all really good info because like poop to mouth or like tainted meat to mouth that can put you down pretty good um rock. what people use rocks, rocks? Uh, another another tip from brit ahart mm -hmm. um wiping with rocks i i i labrador was not the first time that i wiped <laughs> woods and i've always tried to find the softest thing possible but smooth river stones i don't mm -hmm. think i've thought of it in a million years he, he, he sent that my way and um, yeah, around, around smooth river rocks, you can lay them on your hearth and they're nice and warm when you get up in the morning to do your business, <laughs> put them in your pocket to keep you warm while you're trying to do your business. I mean, that was great, man. I'll never go back to leaves crumbling in my hands. Uh, warm river rocks are the way to go. Man, I have never heard of that before. I'm going to have to try it out for myself. It's smooth. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think um, the thing that I use the most out there, since there was so mo so much moss, uh, at least on my territory, 
is I had it uh, near my um, my fire pit. So it would be moist and warm. And I would use that as like a warm wet wipe. And it was, it was, it felt royal. <laughs> What's weird is when you start walking on the beach and you're like walking around looking, you're like, that's, that looks like a damn good wiping rock right there. You start to like look for certain shapes, you know, like rounded, but with a bit of a triangle. I'm like, that's going <laughs> to slide right, right, right in there. <laughs> I'm never going to look at rocks the same. <laughs> uh, I promise you, you won't. And then the bad thing is if you're a rock hound like me, I'm like, that's a good one, but it's too pretty. I can't do that to it. I'm going to leave that one where it is. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Um, one thing that uh, I, I used to do a lot when I was uh, traveling in East Africa, because we wouldn't shower for like three months or something like that, and it's all dry and arid. Um, a lot of people there use like clay to uh, color their hair and whatnot. Um, I used uh, a combination while I was out there, clay and the ash. And I found that just like the texture of my hair after that just uh, felt very clean. Kind of like, have you seen like rodents and stuff like that? Just take dust baths. That's what it kind of felt like. Um, so that's something that I continued. And just looking at it from a chemical standpoint, when you have that little bit of lye with the oils in your hair, and then you put some water, it becomes like a very mild soap. Um, so that's what uh, I kind of used out there. So if you see like videos me on, I saw some promos where my hair kind of looked purple. That's just from Ash. <laughs> that wasn't a weird like nutritional deficit or something. I never thought about that to until you said it, but it makes total sense. You said lye. I mean, I know from tanning that the, you know, the compounds in a lye really just involve acid in the base. So it makes sense. Like yeah. you're saying, I can't believe I didn't think of it. That's brilliant. And yeah. birds too. You see a lot of birds doing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then for teeth, I just like chewed on a stick until it had Brussels. Um, but um, that was mostly for taste because um, like you can use a toothbrush if you wanted to. But yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else use like different things for like just sanitation or like the smells? I used, I, it embarrasses me that I can't remember the name <laughs> of the plant. My, my memory being shorter than my hair, you guys keep talking about hair care. I, uh, <laughs> I thought of you a lot, Mr. Tom, when you were talking about, I really like how you said if you're lucky and you were lucky enough to still have your hair. So you thought you'd put it to use that, that made me smile. I, uh, that was a nice way to put that. Um, so because I was also very concerned with cross-contamination and things of that nature. So really wanted to focus on the hands a lot. And there's the plant that has, I believe, a high concentration of silica. Is it mm -hmm. coontail, horsetail? horsetail? Yeah, yeah, the frizzy green one, right? That's the one. Yeah. And I use that to, like, I'd clean, like, the lid of the pot, you know, if I was using it for, you know, cooking on top of it. And I used it on my hands often. And I, uh, it really cleaned the hands up well. Let's talk about diet and weight gain because uh, we have uh, some kings here <laughs> in our presence. Um, I'll go first because it was a huge struggle for me. Like I'm a fairly athletically thin person. My metabolism is super high. So the only time that I've gained a decent amount of weight and the majority of it is in muscle is when I work out and eat six meals a day. Other than that, like I naturally just cut and lose weight. Um, so I was eating everything that I could, burgers, all the junk food, fats and all sorts of things. And uh, at the end of like six months, I was like up only like 20 pounds. Um, so towards the end, like I had to look at a different direction and take advice from past contestants and JP and uh, I'll let you talk about your strategy because uh, it helped me gain an extra five towards the end. <laughs> yeah. What did you do? Yeah, so normally I guess I look like this. Um, so don't have, a, well, right now I do have some reserves. <laughs> the after, the yo-yo effect of the, the show, but um, yeah, so I, I basically just researched like what's, was the most efficient and effective way to gain weight and like all the bodybuilders are like well it's the the go mad you have a gallon of milk a day um that's what they recommend to 
to gain the most amount of weight. And then there's the Arctic uh, expedition people that they just do like straight olive oil. Um, because like they're doing like, I don't know, like 200 day expeditions or whatever to the South Pole. And they just have to have the most amount of calories. So I knew that you're able, like the human body is able to take a lot of olive oil and also like a lot of milk. So I just built up to it. Um, just started like a liter of milk and then just slowly build up to a gallon. But there's always like, there's like a month of transition when you're just like, just diarrhea. Um, yeah. <laughs> Stuff and it, like now I, I, I look at babies and I'm like, oh, that's why you poop all the time. And that's how your poop's like <laughs> that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I know exactly what you're going through. <laughs> it's, it's just milk, right? So, um, and the thing when you're doing so much stuff like that, you can't eat solids. Like I, I basically, um, so people might be thinking like, oh, it was amazing. Like you could eat all this ice cream and treats and not at all like I could barely uh drink alcohol because it's just a bad combination and then yeah eating solids I had to like I ate a little bit of solids but uh yeah it was mostly by the end it was just like um milk and olive oil so yeah it's pretty crazy and that is I had like crazy reflux every single day I know you and yeah. next week Huh? I know What's that, Tom? Right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that reflux is was so painful that uh, towards the end, I thought I was having a heart attack. It felt like severe chest pain. I was like, oh, I'm eating like so many burgers. Maybe this is something. Um, so luckily, I work in healthcare and I can just ask the cardiologist to be like, hey, can I apply for your research study and get me a free cardiac MRI and all these studies? And it's like, yeah, sure. But it turned out like it was just the reflux from how much fatty grossness that we had to, to indulge ourselves in to, to gain as much weight as possible. Um, Terry, did you have a particular diet that you were adhering to? How much weight did you gain? Well, I, uh, I started at quite a deficit and also I, um, uh... You know, I try to eat very clean. I also seem to have a very fast metabolism. I typically eat 8 to 12 times a day, um, somewhere in the ballpark of 6,000 calories. I usually don't partake of, um, like, processed foods. I eat raw fruits and vegetables, and I eat fish and game that I have procured myself. So usually eat pretty lean. So the transition to the diet was pretty pretty rugged. Um, when I got the call and was informed that I had been accepted uh, to be among you incredible folks, I was 35 pounds lighter than normal, like 35 pounds wow. lighter than my normal walk around weight, which was quite a deficit to make up. Uh, I had been in the Arctic, harvested three caribou, hiked about 60 miles with caribou on my back, basically broke my back. So lost 40 some pounds of muscle and was still recovering when I got the call. I, um, yeah, my diet. So I hadn't bought meat in 10 years. So I wanted to focus on fats. I, I drank three cups of olive oil. Uh, well, right after I got the call, which was a mistake. That was <laughs> and then uh, I, I like how you said, work your way up to it, JP, because, uh, yeah, that's an abrupt learning lesson. I, uh, so I drink, I drink three cups of olive oil every day. Um, I would mix it with shakes and peanut butter. Uh, there was no time I didn't feel miserable. The entire time, every day, felt miserable. It's really, really difficult. I'm thankful for it, but it's very difficult for me to gain weight. So just any time I felt like I wasn't going to be physically sick, as soon as that subsided, I ate again. And a lot of brisket, a lot of ribs, very fatty meats. Uh, and I stuck with that as long as I could. And then eventually I plateaued. And once I plateaued, then I went to sugary, you know, like some ice cream and some carbohydrates just to try to pack on anything, which 
which did help. I ended up gaining 39 pounds, which put me four pounds over my four pounds <laughs> over my normal walking weight. So not exactly advantageous. And then, you know, sitting next to yeah, the king of milk and olive oil. Like <laughs> <laughs> I feel like your stomach JP, your stomach was probably one step away from being a cheese factory, man. <laughs> Yeah, Tom, it's crazy. Yeah, Tom, how about you? Uh, what was the oh. weight that you gained, and what was your prep? <laughs> well, I get the skinny boy prize for sure, but but it's not for lack of trying. I mean, man, dude, I can tell you, you know, Ashley came in to me one time just crying into a giant bowl of of potatoes and bacon grease and cheese and onions. Like I was, I honestly. It sounds great, but to everybody who doesn't, but I, by that point, I was so over it. I didn't even want to see food. It felt like somebody had shot me with a heavy tranquilizer. I'd been on it for so long. I was weeping into this bowl of delicious food because I just didn't want to eat anymore. I didn't want to see it. Like I was force feeding myself. I would cook a lot of bacon, um, take all the fat, and then the bacon fat would go in everything from I shit you not to my coffee to 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 bowls of of white rice just with bacon fat and butter spooned into it and uh i did olive oil i was eating fresh baked bread there was a deli down the road that that uh was was helping me out they were making me this sandwich that was fresh baked bread and brie and bacon and sausage and avocado and, and i would house one of those a day but here we are in the summertime in Virginia and I work on a farm and I'm also active and it was hay season and uh, things were going down. And I was also, I normally sell firewood in the winter. I knew I wasn't going to be there for that. So I was getting my firewood out early and it was a hundred degrees. And I'm like, Terry, I have a fast metabolism. I'm, again, I just, I was just burning it off. So with everything I, everything I could possibly do, uh, including upping my beer intake, um, <laughs> I, uh, I I managed to put on twenty pounds, and uh, then I I guess due to COVID or you know just not being around people for a long time, when I came through that airport, I somewhere along the line I picked up a bug and got sick, as so many of us did, and and I, I deployed sick as well, um, and uh, but that 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 sickness took. Uh, took a took 14 of my 20 pounds from me from the time I got to Goose Bay to the time we stepped on the rock big river so I went in six pounds over my normal walking around weight and um yeah I think but you know if anybody is looking to do it again and they're really really serious uh the one thing that was a, a huge mistake for me is I started I started actively trying to put on weight because for me, it was an economics thing. And also uh, like Terry, I'm making nutritional choices in my life. Um, it was an economics thing and a fact that I don't like to over consume food like that. Um, in my normal life, it's not uncommon for me to eat one meal a day and be fine with that and work mm -hmm. hard at it. I don't think it's a bad thing for people to be hungry, but the mistake that I made was I didn't seriously start taking the weight gain until I knew for certain that I was on the show. Um, and if I could do it again, I'd have banked that I might have been and and started trying to put it on when any interest was taken whatsoever for you know for people looking to, to get on the show. If you if you're even being considered and you're really serious and you really want it, you know, what's the big deal? You could always shed it later. At least that's how I look at it now. I'd have started soon I'd have pushed harder. Um, yeah. but it was really difficult. Yeah, if I were to do it again, I'd uh, um, I, I started six months out, so I was uh, just fingers crossed get selected, and uh, I knew weight gain was going to be one of my biggest struggles, so I, I started really really early. Um, one tip I have for people who want to do the Juan Pablo uh, and uh, do milk, and if you're lactose intolerant, this is a trick that I learned from our dietitian after we got back. So after um, we're out there for so long, um, your lactase, your enzyme to break down your, your dairy products is basically scrubbed from the tip of your, your, your gut and you need to replenish that. And she told me the best way to do that is just a small 
one to two ounces of two uh, percent regular cow's milk um, throughout the day. So three to four times a day to get it so that you're not too bloaty, you don't have a lot of gas, you don't have a lot of diarrhea, and slowly work your up, wait, uh, work your way up to a gallon a day, which is insane to me. Um, and uh, I tried to do the olive oil. I really tried to do it um, when I saw uh, JP do it, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't like take that shot or like put it in my food. So I went through the um, coconut oil route and I felt like that was uh, pretty easy to mix into savory stuff and also to uh, sweet stuff too. With all of that, uh, watch us lose a bunch of weight on a loan. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you all for watching to the end. Uh, before we go, I do want to uh, give time for Terry, Tom, and Juan Pablo to let us know uh, what they're working on uh, in regards to like social media and what the, uh, things are down the pipeline um, so that we can put it all in the description for you guys to click on. So uh, let's go in order, JP. Uh, what uh, What's coming out for you? You got the, your book and what should people, how should people be finding you? Um, yeah, I think maybe in like 10, 14 days, I'll have um, a book ready for sale in Amazon and um, right now, off the top of my head, I don't know my social media handle. I think it's JP dot Quinones Q U N O N E Z in Instagram. Um, yeah, hopefully right you can put that link there. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I'll this will all be on YouTube, and I'll put the link down. And uh, Terry, you're on uh, Facebook and Instagram right now. I am recently, as of like two weeks ago, and. Um, <laughs> I also struggle to remember what is it? A handle? There you go. <laughs> Terry's, Terry's um, I, handle will be down on the description. I, I think and it's, I will be more than happy to help you with that, brother. I think it's my <laughs> name, Terry Burns, and then like 1990, and then Facebook is Terry Burns. And uh, yeah, hopefully sometime this fall I'll have a book coming out uh, again. You look to Juan Pablo for like information you look to me to like oh i don't want to do that so that'll be the differences between the two books <laughs> two ways to learn two ways to learn <laughs> and I'm tom uh, what what's up there um i the 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 digital learning curve is really steep for me as well i mean um i i there's a there's a lot for me to learn there but i am on instagram at appalachia outdoors spelled like i toss it appalachia um, the correct pronunciation of the region that we live in, Terry and I, in case anybody's wondering, and they don't want to sound like they're from out of town. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm on Instagram there as well as YouTube. Um, that channel predates my time on alone and I've recently scrubbed it of its content and I'm looking forward to putting a lot of new stuff. I've got some stuff in the can. that's just awesome. Some stuff with Terry, some stuff with Maddie, some stuff with Adam, um, it's all going to be coming out on the Appalachia Outdoors YouTube channel. For now, I'm just on Instagram and Facebook, but uh, I'm also looking forward to um, taking a deeper dive and teaching some courses on um, less so the skills and more the, the mentality of, mm -hmm. of survival and hunting um, and understanding. It's not the arrow, it's the Indian, I should say, is the old saying they used to say around here. Um, so, you know, my big focus is conservation as well as farming. So a lot of my channel is based on that. But also I, I, I really want to stress the importance to the people that are drawn to the show that you don't need the experience and you don't need the gear uh, as long as you're real with your limitations and you start easy and just slip into it. Like there's no reason at any point in time in your life you can't just become an outdoorsman at, at, that's paramount to the conservation effort. And that's the message that I'm trying to put forward is that don't get hung up on the gear. Don't get hung up on the skills, just like walking into really cold waters, Terry, after that beaver, just go <laughs> nice and slow. Anybody can do this. And I feel like if more people spend time outside, conservation is my passion. Uh, it'll be a lot easier to, to preserve these things. So, so that's what my content's all about. And, and I'm just learning, but I'm really looking forward to sharing more of it with people. Right on. Tom, such beautiful, beautiful words to end this out. Um, I'll put everyone's handles, websites, books, and we'll update it as things uh, keep rolling out. 
And as always, um, if you want to learn the medical side of everything that we're experiencing out there, that's at www.survivaldoctors.com. Uh, I got all my handles out there. So thank you, Juan Pablo, Terry, and Tom for hanging out. And uh, see you guys next time.